Okay, so let me get to where we left off. We had 1 Corinthians last time, so welcome again, everyone. Today is picking up with 1 Corinthians 2 by way of a little bit of review. Paul was not in Corinthian, uh, Corinth excuse me, when he wrote this letter. He was most likely in Ephesus, but he had established and pastored in Corinth a couple of years prior. And he had heard uh, by way of roundabout letters from the area that there were problems in the congregation. And so the book of 1 Corinthians is addressing various issues uh, in an overall context, one of division. And that division represented or expressed itself in a number of different ways that we'll see as we go through the book here. Um, in 2 Corinthians then, he addresses this matter again of factions, but the factions that come through individuals who are seen as um, the person they should follow. And so chapter two leads into that in chapter three, and he starts by talking about the wisdom and contrasting the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of men. So first Corinthians two, says, when I came to you, brothers, I didn't come with excellence of speech or wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. And in the Greek culture, the Greek world, rhetoric was highly valued. This matter of debate when you go to the example of Paul on Mars Hill, this back and forth and this um, philosophizing and this um, argument not not in an angry tone but this back and forth of expressing and sort of playing out these ideas and so he says look we didn't come to you with that kind of language we weren't there to impress you we weren't coming to try to sway you we we're simply proclaiming the gospel message um so again he had touched on this in chapter 1 verse 17 where it says uh, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in wisdom of words, so that the cross of Christ would be made of no effect. You can impress people with language. You can motivate. You can stir up emotion. We've seen this with various despotic leaders or even good leaders. You know, the fireside chats of World War II with Roosevelt, the radio messages of Churchill and how you can inspire people. But the problem with that, unless it changes the heart, it doesn't stay, does it? And actually, if it's based on wrong items, it can lead to very tragic results. Um, so in 2 Corinthians as well, um, he kind of picks up this thought. So 2 Corinthians 11, verse 6, in his follow-up letter to the audience or the congregation there at Corinth, he says, even though I am untrained in speech, and as we'll see in chapter 3, especially, this, this is... Uh, Kind of at the heart of the matter paul was very intelligent very knowledgeable and wrote in as peter said a, a style hard to understand you needed to pay attention because of the way the greek is the verbs that modify the nouns and so forth aren't necessarily next to each other and he's writing on a very deep level um, in a modern context we'd say more of an academic or intellectual level and that can be hard to follow uh, by way of contrast, you have somebody like Apollo, who seemed to be very charismatic, very um, easy to listen to, very motivating. And so Paul acknowledges that that's just not my style. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 6, again, he said, even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Um, he was trained by Jesus Christ in Arabia for three years. He mentions that in the book of Acts as well. So he had the knowledge and he had the calling and the responsibility that was given to him to go out to the Gentile world primarily. And so he says, this is who I am. And so I didn't come to you with excellence of speech, but I came to you with the gospel message. So back to 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Meaning this was, this was why he was doing what he was doing. And he was very focused on that. Paul was uniquely qualified to go to that audience, that area of the Gentile world, the Roman world, the Greek world. Um, 
in Philippians 3 and verse 8, I have a note there. It says, yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and found them as rubbish that I might gain Christ. That is, that he didn't come to them, as it's said in other places, to merchandise them. He didn't come to earn a living off their ties. He didn't come to have power over them. He didn't come for a lot of things that, unfortunately, some can do. He came simply to help them become part of the family of God. He wanted them to have the opportunity, the knowledge, the understanding, excuse me, that he had as well. And so <clears throat> he says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. <clears throat> he didn't think highly of himself, and that's not the way a lot of people um, sort of promote Paul. They see Paul as this very almost arrogant, you know, his pre-conversion perspective, if you will. He was very black and white. <clears throat> he was very letter of the law. He was very pharisaical. He was devoted, though, wasn't he? And God tempered those negative things and helped it to accentuate the positive. <clears throat> and so in 1 Corinthians 18, I have the reference there. I won't read all of that, but chapter 18, especially the first two-thirds of that chapter or so, he's talking about this trip he took to Corinth. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and part of how he established himself there. Um, this matter of weakness as well is an interesting thought. Um, it's generally accepted that Paul had some sort of infirmity. It says that he prayed three times for God to remove it. God said essentially, no, my grace is sufficient. We don't know what it is. Some believe that it was an eye issue. So if you go to um, the bottom of the page there where I have that footnote, Galatians 4 and 6 and 2 Corinthians 12, he speaks of these things. And in uh, the letter, a couple of letters, <clears throat> he mentions about how he wrote, I wrote this with my own hands, but in big letters. And so some believe that that striking down, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that striking down in Acts 9, when God blinded him, that there was something that was left behind after God blinded him temporarily. And Paul himself acknowledges that God allowed this so that he would not think more highly of himself, that he helped, excuse me, that he used whatever this infirmity was to help Paul stay humble, and he did. So this weakness um, can be physical, but weakness can also mean weak compared to the world. So verse 4, 1 Corinthians 2 my speech and my preaching were not in persuasive words of human reasoning, going back to verse 1, same thought, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that is, through what he said and what he did, the miracles wrought, the lives that were changed, the minds that were converted, um, none of that was done through worldly re uh, wisdom. It wasn't done through reason. It wasn't done through logic. It wasn't done through compelling arguments. It wasn't done through flowery speech, you know, this, this emotionally charged, motivating sort of thing. It was through the Spirit and the power of God. And we know from other places that, again, this is not speaking to the Trinity uh, that's falsely taught, but that this Spirit is the power of God. That is God sending forth um, His essence, if you will, to, to do what He wants to do. Um, places like 2 Corinthians 4, 7 that I have noted there. So continuing in verse 6, he says, We speak wisdom, however, among those who are full grown. So this is the contrast. So he says, you're not using the wisdom of the world, but there is wisdom in, in what we're speaking. And it's known by those who are full grown. And the word grown yet, uh, sorry, the word grown there in the Greek is teleos, T-E-L-I-O-S. It simply means to com be complete fully complete. And the word has the meaning of mental or moral character. Humanly, we have uh, an undeveloped brain until we're about uh, somewhere in our mid-20s, depending on the person. The brain's not fully mature yet. This is why young people take higher risk. This is why young people don't have the experience, the wisdom, the understanding to nuance decisions that have great impact. Um, 
and spiritually we're not much different. It takes time to mature into that godly mind. So he says that wisdom, though, is going to be known by those who are complete in terms of spiritual understanding. Yet a wisdom not of this world, nor of the rulers of this world who are coming to nothing. Again, there is wisdom in the world. You look at somebody like Elon Musk, to use a name, and it's impressive what he has done <laughs> on one hand, but on the other hand, it's not impressive in, in some of the ways that he's accomplished what he's accomplished. You can see the same thing about Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or Donald Trump or anybody that's accomplished anything. Just pick your person. They've stepped on toes. They've shaded the truth. They've had dodgy deals, you know, all of these things. They all do it. So he says, you know, even not even that wisdom. We're, we're not playing the angles. We're not we're not being, you know, deceptive while not lying, you know, all of these sort of things. So in James 3 and verse 15, James write this, he says, this wisdom, speaking of godly wisdom, this wisdom does not descend from above. I'm sorry, he was speaking here about the worldly wisdom, that the wisdom of the world does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. Uh, the wisdom of this world is influenced by Satan. It's a mixture, isn't it? It goes back to, as we, those of us that are old enough, remember the regular conversation Mr. Armstrong had about the two trees, the way of get, the way of give. The way of get is the tree of knowledge and good and evil. There's good and evil in it. There are some good things that people can do. You going back to the period of this country's history called the robber baron era. You know, you had uh, J. Paul Getty and you had Rockefeller and you had the Rothschilds and you had DuPonts and you had all these different families that were just making money literally almost hand over fist. Um, and they got to a point, most of them in their life, where they felt really guilty about it. And of course, then there was societal pressure, how much money they were making, all these things. And so a lot of them gave it away towards the end of their life. They would set up foundations. But even in that, they honored themselves, didn't they? They set up foundations that would recognize this money came from whoever, J. Paul Getty or whoever. Um, and, and so it wasn't completely disingenuous. They still wanted the recognition and the validation. Um, and so this is the world. He says, it's not with the wisdom of this world or the rulers of this world who are coming to nothing. The wisdom he speaks of is fully grown, as he says, mature spiritually. Verse seven, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. And, and this is what's confounding, not only to the world, but even in Christianity. If you had asked the average Christian churchgoer, what is the meaning of life? my guess would be they would be hard pressed if they could explain any purpose. They would give a reference probably to being in heaven, but beyond that, they wouldn't have any answer. What is known in scripture to those that God gives his spirit, going back to verse four, is an understanding of what is the purpose of this life. Why did God create mankind? Why is mankind so different than the rest of all the other physical creation? Evolution teaches we're just another animal. And look how that has played out. If we're just another animal, then morals are fluid. Laws are fluid. You know, what I deem as pleasure, you can't deny me. And so we just, we, we descend into this chaos because everybody is their own God. That doesn't go anywhere. Ultimately, it, it leads to destruction. So he says this wisdom, though, in, in God's wisdom, this, this wisdom explains the meaning of life. And so then it tempers. You know, the atheists and the uh, agnostics will great, make great hay out of condemning Christianity for being disingenuous. And they've got a point. A lot of people claim the title and they don't really live the life. The number one demographic in this nation for abortions, uh, and they count that that prime period, if you will, of 18 to 25, is young Christian women. Not women who claim no religious affiliation, the ones who claim to be Christian. And so even they're not living up to it, okay? There's a point to be made there. But what's missed is the good that Christianity has done, even if it's not fully understood. You look at the British Empire, you look at America, you look at some of the Western nations that have gone into various areas and they have improved the lives the caste system of India was awful. The tribal systems in Africa were awful. You know, um, and through 
standardization of laws based on scripture. Again, even if they didn't live up to them, the expectation that they were there, um, the education systems, the medical systems, the, the, the outward looking social good that was done by Christianity, you can't deny in Western culture. But even that comes to nothing. It doesn't explain life, does it? So this wisdom of mystery is what God is doing. And what God is doing is bringing mankind into his family. That's the wisdom he's speaking to, he says. The wisdom that has been hidden. And we read of this in other places as well. You know, um, in Ephesians, it talks about um, the course of this world being influenced by Satan. He's, he's clouded that. Uh, we read in other places about the world being blinded, not seeing it, so it's hidden. A mystery, by definition, is not having a complete picture of something, right? The mystery movie genre. You know, you, you see a story, but what you're not seeing are the things that happened before or things that are ancillary that would explain what's going on. It's hidden. It's a mystery until that information comes through in the story. This wisdom has been hidden, the hidden mystery of what God is doing, which God foreordained before the worlds for our glory. Um, that is, before God created anything, the Father and the Son, before they, you know, in my mind, I picture them sort of like engineers and draftsmen and artists. You know, they sit down and they come up with a plan and they work these things out and they're designing everything and how it all has to work together. And, and it's very fine-tuned, you know, before they, just, if that's anywhere close to being accurate, before they did any of that, they had in their mind why they were doing it. And it was to bring mankind into family. They, they wanted to share the love they had. They wanted to share the joy, the peace, all the positive attributes that is God. They wanted to not just have that for themselves. They wanted a family with them, to have it with them. So verse 8, which none of the rulers of this world has known. Now, we can see that they might have had glimpses, but they didn't fully understand it. Even Nebuchadnezzar understood there was a God of the universe through Daniel. He saw God's hand in his life after he had been a beast, literally a beast of the field for seven years. He understood certain things, but he didn't understand the mystery. He didn't understand the package. Or if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so even the Jews of the first century should have known it, or at least seen enough to ask questions. But they didn't care. They were more interested in their power base. They were more interested in the control they had. They were more interested in the wealth they could generate. The the family, extended family of Pilate, not Pilate, sorry, of Annas and Caiaphas, the high priest family, they made merchandise of God's people. They were not well liked by the average Jew, but because mostly because they did the Romans' biddings, but also because they made money off of everybody. This is Christ driving the animals out of the temple complex. They would make it impossible for people to serve God without coming through them first. And so even they didn't see it. And instead, instead of seeing it, they decided it was more expedient for one man to die, as they said, than for the whole nation to suffer. And so they, they crucified him. So Acts 13, 27 there. Acts 13 and verse 27, it says, For those who dwell in Jerusalem and the rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets which were read every Sabbath, have fulfilled in them fulfilled them in condemning him. So the ones who should have had at least a better idea, the priests were responsible to teach God's people his law. And they should have had a firm understanding of it and also of the history. And to have looked back and seen the prophets bring this message, whether it was Isaiah who speaks a great deal about what we call the, the kingdom to come, but even Daniel or Ezekiel or any of the other prophets. Um, and they, they didn't. They, they didn't inquire and they didn't ask God and they didn't look to those things as being prophetic. In fact, Daniel to this day is not in the prophetic writings because he speaks to when the Messiah would come. And they don't want to hear about that because 
it would validate that they they should have known when he was coming and they rejected him. So if they had known it, Paul says here, they wouldn't have crucified him. They would have seen how God was playing all this out. Um, as he says in verse 7, how it was ordained before the worlds. So verse 9, but as it is written, things which an eye didn't see and an ear didn't hear, which didn't enter into the heart of man, these God has prepared for those who love him. And this is a quote from Isaiah 64, 4. Uh, but let's go and read 1 John 3, 2. You know, what the, the world has valued has clouded what God is offering. In 1 John 3 and verse 2, John here writes, he said, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed. This is, you know, the eye not seeing and the ear not hearing and what is not entered into the heart of man, that we are children. And much of Christianity still sees if you and I would teach that to an average Christian church, it would be recognized in their eyes as heresy, blasphemy even. This was what the Jews of Christ day, when he said, I am, they knew he was claiming the name of God. And they wanted to stone him because that was beyond heresy. That was damnable. And so the eyes have not seen it. Ears have not heard it. They can't comprehend it. To continue in John, 1 John 3, 2. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We will be God. That's the mystery. Going back up to um, verse 7 there. That's the mystery. The mystery is that we will be God, not that we'll live forever. Christianity understands that. They have misconceptions about just gazing at God's glory for eternity or playing a harp sitting on a cloud or, you know, these sort of images. The, the mystery is we will be God, not the Father, not the Son. We will be in the family, though, just like I am a son of my father or mother. Um, John understood this. We will be like him, which means he's spirit in spirit, eternal. We will have the mind and the character of God. Um, so then verse 10, going back to 1 Corinthians 2, but to us, God revealed them through the spirit for the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. And this is spiritual knowledge revealed. God has revealed these mysteries, this truth, this understanding to us through his spirit, because we cannot think like him without his spirit, our natural default, if you will, is carnal human nature. This is the wisdom of the world. This is a mixture of good and evil. It's rhetoric, it's emotion, it's the works of the flesh. It's all of these things. But the spirit, God's spirit searches us in the sense that it should convict us and that we know what sin is because of God's spirit. We recognize it after the fact, we repent and we want to do better and we can through his spirit then put effort to that. So then verse 11, 1 Corinthians 2, for who among men knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man? Okay, so when Nebuchadnezzar's, it, it, it said God removed his spirit from him, that he behaved like an animal. He ate grass the field, his hair grew out. I mean, he was just like a beast. He didn't have the spirit in man. We can see this with people who have had traumatic brain injury. They're alive, their brain functions, but there's nothing there. I've unfortunately witnessed situations where people are in the hospital um, who have suffered brain damage. And in some cases, they're technically dead. They're only alive because of the machines, pumping the oxygen, breathing for them and so forth. There's just a different look, even in their face. You can see there's no spirit there. Um, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. This is the spirit of man. It's deceptive, as it says here. Um, it sees very limited. <clears throat> to try to convince people without God's spirit, the truth of God's way of life is almost an impossible task. 
this is <laughs> speaking as a pastor i i am happy to not have that as a responsibility because you look at the prophets well even just look at what we've done in the last 25 years in the history of the united church of god the the amount of booklets that we've printed magazines we've printed beyond today programs we put out there B, bt dailies how many people have responded if god is not calling them now i'm not saying we shouldn't do those things please don't misunderstand but without god being the motivating force to engage and equip and edify and to change their heart and mind the spirit of man's not going to get it it's the three-prong plug trying to go into a two-prong outlet you've got to have the adapter the spirit of man doesn't do it on its own so then to continue in verse 11 first Corinthians 2 even so no one knows the things of god except by god's spirit we can answer for the hope that is within us but it is not our job to try to change someone. We can set the example. We can point them to God's truth. We can answer questions as best as we can. But unless God is working in them, without God's spirit, they're not going to see it. Um, in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 and verse 14 it says, For as many are as led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And this goes back up to being fully grown in verse 6. <clears throat> the wisdom that we have compared to the wisdom of the world. This is the mystery, isn't it? To have God's Spirit in us, helping us to see things differently, to behave differently, to begin to change that carnal nature, being put away to become more like God, the Father and the Son. Um, Romans 8 and verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. The spirit of bondage we had was before God called us, before we were baptized, before we were given a measure of his spirit, before we set our foot to the path of growing with that spirit. That was the bondage, the bondage of the world. You know, the, the false gods that were served, the false philosophies that became a foundation for life, the works of the flesh unchecked all these things but we've been adopted as romans 8 verse 15 says there at the end but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out father abba father so we don't have that unless we have god's spirit that's the difference between well there's a difference between not having God's spirit, having God's spirit with you and having God's spirit in you. That's the process of conversion. When God calls us, we don't have God's spirit at all. But he begins to work with us so that his spirit is with us. We come to understanding whatever the doctrines are that, that click with us, Sabbath, the holy days, the food laws, tithing, military service, whatever it happens to be. And then as we progress through that, as God adds to our spirit and leads us to repentance, and then upon baptism, he gives us a portion of his spirit, a down payment, like an earnest payment. It's just the beginning. And then we grow in that. We begin to see more and more and more. And even with knowledge, we get to a point where it's not just knowledge. We begin to see and understand what God is showing through the knowledge. The Sabbath day is not holy just because God says so. Not because it's just one day he picked and decided this is the day. The Sabbath day is holy because he is in it. And the Sabbath day is sort of the, the first step to understanding everything that he's doing. Because the Sabbath day is all about submission to him. Otherwise, we're, we're no different than the Jews that just see this 24 hours where you can't do anything. So going back to 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 12, but we receive not the spirit of the world. So he's continuing this thought, but the spirit which is from God. This is Think of this chapter again as the foundation for the comments he's going to make about divisions and heresies of various sorts. If we have the spirit of God, if we have the wisdom of God, we shouldn't have those things. We shouldn't have the division. We shouldn't have the heresy. We shouldn't have these disagreements so he said, but we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God, that we might know the things which were freely given to us by God. What did we have to pay for? 
having God's spirit? What 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 could we have done that would have obligated God? You know, a, a business exchange. I'll give you X for Y. We use money. You can do it with bartering. I'll trade you my car for this, you know. We didn't have anything to give God because it's all God's to begin with. It all came from him. It was all sustained by him. What we gave him was our willingness to submit. And then he can work with that. In that humility, he can begin to teach us and show us. But he freely gave it to us. He didn't obligate anything from us. Because there's nothing ultimately we could give him that would be of the value of what he is offering. And so then to continue in verse 13, 1 Corinthians 2, which things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. So back to the Sabbath example. We, we have something physical that shows us the spiritual, don't we? We have a period of time that's physical. We watch the sun. It sets Friday night. It sets Saturday night. We know that's the Sabbath day. But that the wisdom that comes from it is not through words. Is it? It's not through the Greek rhetoric. It's not through the emotional pleading. Uh, it's not through any of those ways that would be done in the world. It comes from the Holy Spirit that compares then spiritual things. So as we keep the Sabbath, we learn that it's not just that 24-hour period. It's a matter of the relationship we have with God. Now, the Sabbath day is holy. It is important. I'm not saying it's not. But it's not just physical time. It's not just staying home from work. It's not just avoiding you know, pleasure, going shopping, or going to the movies, or going to the park, you know, swimming, having all these activities to fill the day. It's not just those things. It's what God is pointing through in that day. Hebrews 4, there remains a Sabbath rest. You know, it's not just that 24-hour period because it points to something. It talks about the rest that we have in God. I, I would hope that as we, even in this lifetime, age physically, we can see that. It's not just about being tired because of age. It's for God's people. It's tired because we're done with the world. It's not fixing itself. It's not getting any better. It's not bringing the things that are of value. It's just more of the worse. And so this is not the wisdom of the world. This, this is through God's spirit, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. So verse 14, 1 Corinthians 2, now the natural man does not receive the things of God's spirit, carnally minded man. If they did, we could go back in this modern era, even back into the 1930s, Mr. Armstrong starting with what God was doing through him, what was done through Worldwide, what's been done through United, and even if we want to expand it out, other Church of God groups that remain faithful to the doctrines, core doctrines, We've, we've probably touched just, I would guess, maybe 96 or 7% of the world, probably. It's a guess, but it's out there. Anybody that wants to find it can find it. You know, in the late, not the late, in the early 1980s, um, one of my jobs when I worked in Pasadena and publishing services was to create a chart that showed the weekly penetration of the World Tomorrow program at the time. And at that time, even at that time, we had the potential of reaching 95% of this country on Sunday morning with that program. Doesn't mean 95% of the country watched it, but we were on enough TV stations in various places across the nation. 95% of this nation would have had opportunity to understand, hear that. Plain Truth Magazine at its zenith was almost 7 million copies a month. Second only to Reader's Digest. And I think they had something like 10 million a month. So it's out there. If it was just about knowledge, if it was just about words, then the natural man would have had this and been convinced, right? But Paul says here in verse 14, the natural man doesn't receive these things because as he said back in verse 12, um, the mind doesn't get it. 
You don't understand the spiritual aspects without God's spirit. The natural man doesn't have God's spirit. So here, here's a question for you. Will there be carnal nature in the millennium and the last great day? There will be. But there will also be God's spirit that will be offered. It's not offered right now to the world because that then brings judgment. Once you know the choice is before you, then you're judged on what you're choosing. There is going to be carnal nature, but the difference also is that it will not be magnified, amplified. It will not be corrupted by Satan's influence. What we have now is carnal nature on steroids because of Satan's influence. We'll still have it. We'll still have to teach people right or wrong. This is Isaiah, right? This is the way walk you in it. We'll still have to teach God's way of life to people. We'll still have to show them why it's important and what the outcomes are. And maybe we'll become history teachers in part. You know, God will do some sort of data dump and we can point them back to the time period they lived in physically in this world, in this age. And we can say, okay, here's what this leader was doing. Here's that, that look, look at what came out of the politics. Look at what came out of the business. Look at what came out of the culture and, and teach them and show them by way of contrast, what is now in the millennium, what is now in the last great day time period. And we'll be able to contrast it and say, Satan's way of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil versus God's way of life, the tree of life. And they'll still have to choose. It's free will. And free will becomes, through free will comes character building. And the better choices you make, the better character you develop. So the natural man doesn't see these things. It says because they're foolish to them. I, <laughs> I had a boss just dumbfounded one time because I refused to work Sabbath, obviously. Her response was that I was losing out on time and a half. To her, that was the more important thing than what I saw as valuable in my relationship with God. She saw it, as it says there, as foolishness. Why would you not take the money? Paul goes on to say here, he says, and he can't know them. Again, that three-prong outlet trying to go in that two-prong plug, it, it can't happen without the adapter. And on our own, the carnal mind, the human mind, does not have that adapter, does not have that ability. It can't know it because those things that Paul's talking about here, the wisdom of God is spiritually discerned. So if you're still in Romans, if you have your Bible open to there, let's go to verse 5, Romans 8, verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. So we see it in the world around us. You know, I, <laughs> if grieve is the right word, you know, I grieve for the car dealerships as I drive through town here because we have like, let's see, four, at least four on this side of town where I live. And they're, they're lots. They look like they're out of business. They've got maybe a dozen cars sitting in front of it, and they try to keep moving them around and make it look like more, but, but they can't get cars to sell. But if they had them, I tell you what, they would be moving them because right now, even though it looks like they don't have much, anytime new cars show up, I see every so often a truck will pull up with not even a full load, and within days, those cars are gone. We're still buying. People are out eating now that COVID is in many minds, a, a distant memory, even though it's still out there. People are still chasing after things of the world. And so, as Paul says here in Romans 8 and verse 5, they set their minds on these things because what else do they have? If they don't understand God's plan of salvation, then this life is it. I might as well try to have as much fun and happiness and feel good as much as I can because I... I have no expectation of anything after this. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, meaning their minds are set on the things of the Spirit. And that's why, going back to verse 14, 1 Corinthians 2, it seems foolishness to the world. Because the Spirit are the things of the future. Back in the late 90s, uh, there was a teaching that came through the psychological circles about emotional IQ. They called it EQ. 
And what they began to see in these various studies was that individuals who could delay gratification had a happier life, typically, because they valued what they were waiting for, as opposed to satisfying an immediate desire. And so the test was simple. They would take six, seven-year-old kids, and they would put a cupcake in front of them. They're sitting at a table, and they would say, that cupcake's yours. You can have that cupcake. But here's the thing. I'm going to leave the room. I'll be gone five minutes. If I come back and you haven't eaten that cupcake, I'll give you another one. And they'd leave the room. And they'd have cameras. They would watch the kids. And some of the kids, it was like everything they could do to not grab that cupcake. And they would look at it. And they would sort of pick at the paper cup it was in. They would push it forward. They'd pull it back. They'd do all these things. And then finally, you could just see it. It'd click. They'd say, okay, I'm done. And they would grab it, take the paper off, and start munching on it. Others, they would look at it. In some cases, they'd push it away. Some cases, they wouldn't. And they would just sit there. They'd look around the room. They'd maybe get up and walk to a corner, you know, whatever. But the cupcake was just not even on their mind. And they had no problem waiting. But this correlation between delayed gratification and benefits, um, Paul here talks about this is the spirit. The mind, having the mind of things of the spirit versus the mind of things of the flesh, which is why I believe God's people have more joy. It's not that our lives are inherently better. We have trials. We have persecution. We have difficulties. We have all of these things that are in the world. People in the world have trials. Their children die. They get cancer. They lose jobs. Marriages break up. All of these things are not unique to the world. What's unique is our hope, the things of the Spirit. That this life is not the life that God wants us to have for eternity. This life is to learn, to become like him so we can have the life he has for eternity. And so this is what Paul is talking about here in Romans 8 and verse 5, to have our mind set on the things of the Spirit. This is what he's talking about here in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 2. The things of the flesh are what's on the mind of the world. The things of the Spirit are foolishness to them. It's stupid not to go have fun now sexually or to experiment with drugs or experiment with your gender or experiment with whatever to chase whatever you think is going to bring you value. It's foolishness to delay those things because they have to be spiritually discerned. Jude, verse 19. Jude is only one chapter, so verse 19, it says, these are sensual persons who cause divisions. And again, this is what Paul's leading up to here in this next chapter. He's setting the stage here in chapter 2 of a perspective, a difference of perspectives between a wisdom of the world and a wisdom of God, of valuing the things of the world versus valuing things of God. And if we value the things of God, divisions and heresies shouldn't exist. We're going to have growth. We're going to develop into a, a family that's unified in purpose and mind and desire and the harmony that comes from that is just not that we all sit around and no, nothing happens we're engaged but we're doing the same thing for the same reasons and so it's not a matter of position or power or name or fame or money or anything else that the world chases we're there because we're part of god's family and we're each doing whatever we can so verse 15, 1 Corinthians 12, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians 2, he says, but he who is spiritual discerns all things, and he himself is judged by no one, meaning outside in the world. They can condemn us like they did Christ. They can judge them. They think according to a right standard, but in God's minds, in God's eyes, that judgment means nothing because he's looking at the heart. Mankind can't look at the heart. It's not something we can do it's spiritually discerned that's another thing i'm glad is not in my bag of responsibilities not my job to judge anyone frankly 
<laughs> if I did have that responsibility, I'd probably get most of it wrong because we don't we don't know the internal struggle. We don't know the thoughts. We don't know the challenges. We don't know the behind the scenes. We don't know so much of what's going on because we're only seeing just a slice of the reality, aren't we? So Proverbs 28, verse 5. Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the eternal understand all. We understand that God's in charge. We understand that God will judge. We understand that God is fair. We understand that God is going to have, hold everyone accountable. He, he will judge everyone, every individual, but he's also gracious and merciful and patient and loving. We understand those things. That puts a whole different filter on how we view life, doesn't it? We can see the injustice of the world. We can see the evil. We can see the suffering. We can see the unfairness. We can see all these things, but we don't have to get tied up in this world trying to fix these things because they're unfixable by the world's way. God will fix them in the right way, in the right time. So that the righteous understand these things. So back to 1 Corinthians 2 in verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? That's a quote from Isaiah 40, verse 13. But we have Christ's mind. <laughs> okay, we're not instructing God according to what Isaiah wrote. It's not that we're trying to instruct God. This was the conversation God had with Job, right? Towards the end of the book, he says to Job, okay, Job, if you're so smart with everything, how does the earth hang in the sky, the universe? How is it just out there? How do the animals know when spring comes to bring forth the next generation? How do the plants know when to grow? How does the snow know when to come? You know, all these things that he puts before Job, if you're so smart, instruct me. Okay, so we're not trying to do that. We're not trying to instruct God, but we do know the mind of God because he gives us his spirit. That's Philippians 2.5, right? That we take on the mind of Christ. If you're still in Psalms there, Psalm, or I'm sorry, we were in Proverbs. So let's go back to Psalm, Psalm 25 and in verse 14, David writes this. He says, the secret of the eternal is with those who fear him. The mystery that Paul talked about earlier in the chapter, that's with us. We should understand those things. God's way of life is not a mystery to us. John 15, verse 15. This is the discourse Christ was having with his disciples the night before he died. So John 15, verse 15, he says to them, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. Right? The various public sector jobs I've had over the years, boss didn't have to explain anything to me. I had my little slice of whatever it is I was supposed to do, whatever job I had. Sometimes I saw how that fit into the bigger scheme of things, and sometimes I didn't. More often than not, I didn't. I had no clue what he was dealing with in terms of contracts, uh, the other challenges he had with other employees, uh, trying to get new business coming in, paying the bills, all the, I had no idea. And that's typically a servant, right? We don't, we're, that's not our job. We're not involved in those things. So he says, no longer do I call you a servant. For a servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. And that's verse 13, just prior to that, right? They lay down your life for your friends. And so he says, I'm, I'm that friend. I'm willing to do that. I have called you friends for all things you heard from my father. I have made known to you. I've not held anything back. He says, I've not kept anything from you that you need for eternal life. Do I have questions? Yes, I have questions. What happens after Revelation 22? All of mankind that wants to become part of God's family is spirit. Those who are adamant and determined they do not want to submit yield to god they will be dust what happens then what do we do then god's a creative god look at what he's been doing for the whole history of mankind that's for a purpose it's not just so he can be surrounded by this fan club he wants to do something i have no idea what he's going to do i have questions about things in the past how things happened what noah preached i want to what did noah preach for 120 years. Would it would it resonate with us? 
Well, did he have more understanding or less understanding of what we have of the mystery? What about Abraham? He he knew something, said that he looked for a foundation with, without, uh, a city rather, without foundations made by man. Uh, so I have questions, but th those questions are not relevant to my salvation, are they? Christ has not withheld anything we need to know, to know how to do so that we can have salvation, eternal life. So he's not withheld anything throughout. This is the, this is the mind of Christ. This is the wisdom of God. This is the spirit of God working in us. And so chapter two has set the stage for chapter three because one of the divisions, again, were, were factions of support behind certain men. And so next time we'll get into 1 Corinthians 3 and we'll discuss that at greater length. So until then.